Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Nicole Haldupis, and I'm the Promotions and Publicity Coordinator at the University of Manitoba Press. We're really excited to launch Daniels versus Canada. I don't know if you've had a chance to see this book, but it is very beautiful. The cover art is by Christy Belcourt. Um, tonight, today, we will be joined by the editors, Dr. Nathalie Kermol, Dr. Chris Anderson, as well as contributors to the book, Dr. Brenda Gunn, Dr. Brenda McDougall, and Dr. Daryl LaRue. First, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba Press is located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. U of M respects the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Our next spring book launch is for Being German Canadian, History, Memory, Generations, which will feature a panel discussion with the editor and several contributors who will be joined by the Consul General from the Toronto German Consulate. And this launch is happening next Wednesday, May 26th at 12 p.m. You can register on our, on our website or watch it on Facebook. Um, I'm also going to share a 30% off code in the chat um, if you buy the book directly from the U of M Press website. Um, if you'd like to purchase the book but don't want to do it through our website, um, we urge you to support independent bookstores. McNally Robinson Booksellers in Winnipeg and Saskatoon is a great example. They do a lot for their local writers and they do ship across Canada. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Nathalie Kermol. Nathalie is a Breton, a people whose territory is situated on the west coast of France. She holds a PhD in history from the University of Ottawa and is full professor in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. Kermel has published three books and numerous articles in academic journals and collected volumes. Her areas of research are Métis issues, Aboriginal constitutional issues, urban Indigenous history, and Indigenous women's issues. In 2011 to 2012, she served as interim dean of the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. And in 2013 to 2014, she was special advisor on Aboriginal academic programs with the Provost Office. Since 2009, Kermel has been Associate Dean Academic of the Faculty of Native Studies. And as of January 2016, she has also been Director of the Rupert Land Center for Métis Research at the Faculty of Native Studies. Please welcome Nathalie. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Um, so I'm going to share my screen as I have a little presentation. So before we start, um, I'd like, uh, well, first of all, Tense, bonjour, good afternoon, bonjour. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, that are here with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, traditional gathering place for Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoda Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. I would like also to introduce uh, the co-editor of the book, uh, Dr. Chris Anderson, uh, who is uh, going to do the presentation with me. Um, Dr. Anderson is Métis, originally from the Parkland region of Saskatchewan. Uh, he received his PhD in 2005 from the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta and became a faculty member of uh, the Faculty of Native Studies uh, uh, later on, and, and now he is our uh, dean. 
Chris has published some very important books and one of them uh, is, one of the many is uh, Métis race, race Recognition and the Struggle for Indigenous Peoplehood. And he received a prize from the Native American and Indige Indigenous Studies by the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association for, for the book. Um, Chris is also a member, founding member of the NASA Executive Council and editor of the journal Aboriginal Policy Studies. In 2014, he was named a member of the inaugural class of the Royal Society of Canada's Co College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists. So we're here today um, to talk about our new book, uh, Daniels versus Canada, In and Beyond the Courts. And before we, we go into the book, I would like to, to tell you a little bit more about uh, the Rupert Land Center for Métis Research, um, which is a joint venture uh, between the Métis Nation of Alberta, the Rupert Land Institute for Métis Excellence, the Faculty of Native Studies, and the, the University of Alberta. RCMR, as it is known, is housed in the Faculty of Native Studies uh, at the University of Alberta and is an academic research program specifically geared towards Métis issues. In 2021, we're lucky because we're uh, actually celebrating our 10-year anniversary. So I always say to people that uh, we're reaching the preteen years. Um, Soon will be teens, but uh, we're still doing, uh, we're doing good. Um, the goals and objectives of the Research Center include building provincial and national connections uh, with the Métis community, increasing research capacity to advance Métis specific research and training and employing student, student researchers um, and we organize all kinds of different events um, a lot of uh, conferences. Um, we do also what we call uh, uh, Métis Talks, uh, which we have uh, uh, several times a year, and many other workshops and, and uh, book launch uh, like this one. So one of those events uh, was um, a big conference that we had in, in 2017 at the University of Alberta uh, regarding uh, the Daniels decision. And the conference brought political leaders, uh, researchers, students, and community members to discuss uh, together the recent Supreme Court decision, um, the Daniels decision. And the conference touched on different types of topics like identity, politics, law, and belonging were covered. So it was really an opportunity for everybody to get together and to not only net, do some networking, but also engage in dialogues and uh, to also further understanding of the issues, challenges and successes around the case. And of course, um, when the, because of the, the success of the conference, we decided that we needed to go further and uh, that's why we decided to, to publish a book. So in the book, we have uh, a, you know, a, a variety of texts and some of them were not presented at, at that specific conference. And uh, so in that sense, they're very uh, original, but um, overall, um, as, as uh, Chris will explain, uh, Soon, um, you know, the book uh, covers a wide variety of topics. So, Chris, if you want to take over. Sure, thanks, Natalie. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I think it should be noon for uh, anyone who's in uh, some place in uh, North America at the moment. For those of you who are abroad, thank you for your uh, resiliency, but I don't know what time it is there. Um, part of the Part of what we wanted to do when we uh, were looking to move from the actual conference to the book was to think about all the different ways in which uh, the Daniels decision has impacted 
kind of different fields or, or different different uh, social arenas um, in in Canada. And so, from our perspective, or at least from my perspective, one of the things that's fascinating about this decision is that a decision was written in which people who are diametrically opposed to each other in terms of how they think about things both walked away claiming a victory. Uh, and as someone who uh, fancies himself as a recovering sociologist, this was really kind of sociologically interesting to me. But it was also uh, uh, the the um, uh, the conference itself uh, made it very clear that different people who were located in different disciplines and had kind of different interests were taking very very different approaches to uh, what the importance of the Daniels uh, decision uh, was. And so, from our perspective, uh, we wanted to we wanted to put a, a volume together in which we invited people from a lot of different uh, disciplines, a lot of different professional walks of life. Um, and to, to think about what law means beyond its, its uh, jurisprudential manifestations. And I remember having a discussion with um, a friend of mine a while back who kept telling me when the decision came out that it, it was a, people were sort of up in arms about it. And, and, and she said that it was, it was being wildly overblown and that people didn't really understand what was being established in the, in the decision. Uh, and people were talking about it without the proper expertise. And as I say in my uh, chapter, I sort of let it end there because I wasn't 100% sure that she wasn't talking about me when she said that people were talking about it uh, without the proper uh, expertise. Um, but it this this case, as in many uh, uh, Aboriginal rights cases, becomes a really important way to think about what the power of law is beyond the actual court case itself, beyond what it's kind of originally intended to be and the way in which it permeates into Different, into uh, different areas of society. And when we finally got all the authors uh, uh, together who wanted to uh, uh, contribute a volume to the book, this is something that we really saw uh, at the end. And in fact, in some ways, it made it uh, an interesting exercise to write both the introduction uh, and the conclusion because we had so many different disciplines and so many different professions uh, that were being represented uh, in the chapters. And so it turned out to be a, a, pretty, a pretty cool little book, I would say. So Natalie, I'll turn it over to you again. Thank you, Chris. Um, sorry. So we have a, a number of uh, contributors, as as you can see, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit uh, more about. Um, and so we have eleven chapters. Um, sorry, um, I have two computers right now, so uh, going. So the first two chapters uh, uh, in the volume focus uh, on history. Uh, so both uh, pay tribute to the Métis politicians, including Harry Daniels, who fought the hard battles that set uh, the stage for the recognition of Métis rights evidence in Daniels. And we have to remember that up until 1982, um, there was uh, no provision in Canada's constitution that recognized and affirmed the existence existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of, of Aboriginal peoples, no provision stating who the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are, and no equality clause prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex, and no Supreme Court decision confirming the existence of any Métis rights. So overall, when we're looking at those first two chapters, it's recent history that provides the contextualization crucial to understanding the importance of the Daniels decision for Métis communities. And chapter one um, is, was written by Tony Belcourt, uh, one of the actors of the time. And he clearly expresses what was sought, what was achieved and the consequences for Métis people today. So, um, after those um, specific chapters that are focused uh, on history, um, we have after we we also have like uh, four chapters that are providing legal analysis of the Supreme Court decision. And today we're very lucky to have with us uh, Dr. Brenda Gunn, who who will tell us a little bit more about what uh, what's in her chapter. And then no specific uh, legal chapters um, are followed by four other chapters uh, that examine 
some of the broader societal implications of the Daniels decision. And um, so the decision uh, itself makes for an excellent started, starting point for thinking about the sometimes valve, vast gulf between what jur jurisprudential scholars think about the merits of a given decision and how that decision gets uh, put to use by a variety of social and political actors outside the comparatively narrow confines of the jurisprudential arena. And today we have with us um, two scholars that are presenting those uh, social implications, uh, Daryl LaRue um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Brenda McDougall. So um, I will be presenting to start uh, Dr. Brenda again, and I need to switch uh, screens for now. Dr. Brenda Gunn is a professor at the University of Manitoba in the Faculty of Law. She has a BA uh, from the University of Man Manitoba and a JD from the University of Toronto. She completed her LLM in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy at the University of Arizona. She articled to a Sierra Legal Defense Fund um, and she was called to the bars of Law Society of Upper Canada and Manitoba. Brenda also worked um, at a community legal clinic in Rabinal, uh, Guatemala, on a case of genocide submitted to the Inter-American Commu Commission of Human Rights. As a proud Métis woman, she continues to combine her academic research with her activism, pushing for greater recognition of indigenous people's inherent rights as determined by indigenous people's own legal traditions. Her current research focuses on promoting greater conformity between international law on the rights of indigenous peoples and domestic law. So please welcome uh, Dr. Brenda Gunn. Good day, everyone. I'm honored and excited to be here today launching this book with uh, some of my co-contributors. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Treaty One territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation and from my dining room in Winnipeg. Uh, I would really like to start by thanking the co-editors and uh, the support team at the Rupert Land Center for helping me get my chapter completed and edited and being patient with um, my inability to perhaps meet any deadline um, as we went through. But I'm uh, really excited that we are here today. And I think I'll try to keep it short and just spend a few minutes going over what my chapter looks at. So, my chapter really tried to look at and maybe address the increase in self-declared Métis people who are claiming some form of indigeneity because of the Supreme Court statement in Daniels that Métis can be used as a general term for anyone with mixed European and Aboriginal heritage. Now, in my opinion, when the court made this comment, they recognize that some people have invoked this definition of Métis, as well as uh, the court was attempting to ensure that the federal government's responsibility over Métis people was extended to all those who may have been inappropriately excluded from Métis communities. However, regardless of the court's intention, the concern has been raised and we're seeing the result that the court may have diminished the recognition of a distinctive Métis people and um, concerns that maybe the court has undermined Métis people's right to determine who is Métis. And so what I did in my chapter then is I looked at Daniels in light of the rights of Indigenous peoples 
recognized in international law, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so what I try to do is provide some insight into how international human rights law, including the UN Declaration, may alleviate some of the concerns that are being raised around people's claims to be Métis based on this sort of expansive definition um, of Métis as mixed. So the chapter uh, starts with a recognition that in international law, there is no universal definition of Indigenous peoples, including in the UN Declaration. Uh, it's widely accepted that uh, it would not be appropriate for the United Nations, of course, to set a definition of who is Indigenous. And there is strong respect for the uh, self-definition and recognition of Indigenous peoples. However, it's important to re recognize that internationally, there are some discussions about who is Indigenous and that this has kind of been established generally in international law. And so I point to one potential understanding of who is Indigenous, which is a study of the working group of Indigenous populations, where they identified four factors that were relevant to understanding who is Indigenous. And so they say that Indigenous peoples characteristically have a prior occupation of a specific territory, as well as a distinctive culture, including language, social organization, religion, and spiritual values, modes of production, and laws and institutions. And so based on this uh, characterization of Indigenous peoples, you know, I spend just a short period of time showing how very easily the Métis Nation meets these criteria. And I don't spend a lot of time trying to prove this because I'm not sure that it's um, an issue that needs to be proven. So we can, you know, I just very quickly point to the fact um, that uh, there's a clear and distinct historic Métis people that have a defined traditional territory in the Northwest of Canada. Um, that the Métis nation has a distinct culture, uh, specific languages, specific sets of religious practices and values, that there are Métis specific forms of governance that you can see historically and presently to today from the Buffalo hunt, the provisional government in Manitoba to our current Métis governments. There are, is lots of evidence of Métis specific laws and we can see these recorded back to the 1800s. Uh, of course, there's evidence of a specific Métis nation identity that you can date back to at least the Battle of Seven Oaks and the Sayre trial. Um, and then, you know, I point to just a really quickly a few ideas that of course there's been a common experience of uh, subjugation or colonization in Canada which has led to the dispossession of Métis peoples from their lands uh, and territory and so I very easily am able to conclude that uh, the Métis nation in Canada easily meets the criteria for uh, who is Indigenous in international law. And then I contrast that very briefly, of course, to some of the newly asserted uh, Métis peoples or Indigenous peoples in Canada that are relying on some of the comments in the Daniels decision about Métis as mixed. So um, you can see that many of these groups um, do not come from any specific or defined territory. Eastern Woodland Métis Nation of Nova Scotia membership criteria talks about it accepts anyone as a mixed Native and uh, non-Native heritage and as long as you self-identify as Métis they'd be accepted. They talk about their members coming from all walks of life, Mi'kmaq, Cree, Ojibwe, Blackfoot, Sioux and other Native peoples. And so when you start looking at those criteria that I talked about and trying to apply that, you can see that there's no uh, shared history, no defined territory. And so from an international law perspective, to the extent we think that's useful, these new groups that are asserting some form of indigeneity would not generally meet the accepted ideas of who is indigenous. And then once I've um, 
sort of set out how I think international law helps us address some of those challenges that we're seeing today. I briefly talk about some of the rights that may flow from um, that recognition and um, at least that are recognized in international law. I mean, not sort of that international law gives rights, but that international law recognizes, which would include the right of self-determination, which includes the right to determine one's own membership, rights to traditional lands, territories, and resources, and the right to participate in decision-making, including the rights to free prior and informed consent. And so, um, that was my modest undertaking in this chapter was really to sort of try to see if there's any other tools we can use to help alleviate some of the concerns stemming from some of the court's comments in, in the Daniels decision. So I think I'll leave it at that and uh, I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations and having a conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. So our next, uh, our next uh, sp speaker is uh, Dr. Daryl LaRue, who is uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Social Just Justice and Community Studies at St. Mary's University in Kshipuktuk, Halifax, in unceded Mi'kmaq territory. He is a white settler whose Norman, Poitvin, Breton, and Parisian ancestors were among the first Europeans to colonize the St. Lawrence River Valley. His interest in exposing current, current efforts by French descendants to claim indigenous identities comes from his engagement with anti-colonial thinkers and activists. His book, Distorted Descent, White Claims to Indigenous Identity was published by the University of Manitoba Press in 2019. Please welcome Thanks, Nathalie. Uh, and thank you, Brenda, as well, and, uh, and to Chris. Uh, I just want to say that, first of all, yeah, I'm here in uh, Jibuktuk, which is uh, otherwise known as Halifax in uh, Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq Territory, where I've lived for the, about the past 10 years. And uh, I just want to say that the um, that the conference that took place in 2000, January 2017 was amazing. I still have very fond memories of that conference. Uh, the level of, of discussion um, around Métis rights and Métis identity was like nothing I'd ever experienced. And I learned a great deal um, uh, being present and, and hearing from people from uh, academia, but also more importantly from different communities all throughout uh, the West and the North. Um, so I just, uh, I really appreciate the, the, the work that the Rupert Land Center does and um, I uh, just want to thank them for sponsoring this event with uh, the University of Manitoba Press. Uh, so what I decided to do at the conference, so I'm one of those um, people who are not so much talking about legal ramifications or the jur jurisprudent, uh, jurisdictional or, or sort of um, juridical sort of questions that the Daniels decision raised. I'm one of those people in the book who's raising questions about the sort of social and political impacts of the decision. Uh, and so I, I decided to um, present uh, an overview of what I call in the, what I end up calling in the book, Eastern Métis Studies. Um, and in particular, I, um, I look at a range of of uh, academic texts, so it's really uh, limited to academic texts published by um, usually um, professors or graduate students. Um, and so I, I, I follow a range of texts that um, in my analysis start in 2005 with a PhD thesis at the University of British Columbia. And then um, I think given that the conference was in 2017, I'm able to more or less review things uh, up until the conference and a little bit after, so maybe 2018, which means I missed a few things that have come out recently. But I think it's a good overview of of what um, the sort of quote unquote Eastern Métis studies does or what it's attempting to do. Um, and in particular, 
what I do is, so most of what I'm calling Eastern Métis studies, um, again, always in quotation marks because there are no Eastern Métis peoples as distinct peoples. Um, so I'm talking about the academic wing of the political movement. Um, and it's primarily in French. There are a couple pieces that are in English that I review, but um, at this time, really when uh, it was mostly stuff that had, had come out prior to the end of 2016, um, it was almost entirely in French. That has changed little. There's a little bit more from the same authors available in English um, now, but it's still primarily in French. So my idea was to go out um, to Edmonton and present at this conference on uh, you know, what uh, was being said in French about the Métis people, Métis uh, nationhood, uh, Métis self-determination and sovereignty um, in this uh, literature. And so what I do is I, I break down um, the arguments into two sort of main themes. Um, and these are two themes that really emerged as I was reading this whole body of literature. Uh, and so the, the first theme is what I call um, the new Métis, creating a people, and I say here Métis in quotation marks. So this is where in the literature, uh, the idea of Métis ethnogenesis um, or ethnogenesis itself is, um, is creatively reinterpreted. So uh, for those who've been following the so-called Eastern Métis movement, or maybe what I'll do from now on is call it the self-indigenization movement of white French descendants, which I study closely, um, you will be familiar with this narrative, but essentially this is a story where the first um, quote unquote Métis people actually emerge in the 1600s in the St. Lawrence Valley and a little bit further um, east where I am currently um, in what the French called Acadia, what is now generally, um, generally called uh, Nova Scotia. So there's this idea that there's this mixed race people um, here uh, in New Brunswick and in Quebec who emerge in the 1600s. And uh, they, are, they are actually the people who end up going out west to um, Red River and even further points west. And they create, they found the actual Métis nation. Um, so this is something that I, um, I, I pull out of this literature from all kinds of different scholars, people who um, teach in uh, departments of law, anthropology, geography. Um, that's pretty much, oh, maybe even history that pretty much runs the gamut of the, of the scholars I, I study in this piece. And so we have this new story where it's people from out east, not Quebecois men or French Canadian men, but in this case, men who were already imagined as quote unquote Eastern Métis, um, who go out West and they're the ones who create the Métis nation. Therefore, the Métis nation would not exist without these people out East. So that's the first, um, you know, uh, argument that I outline. And again, I outline in a lot, quite a lot of detail how there's no actual basis in this um, this narrative, in fact, um, at all, and, and but it gets raised by these scholars um, as a fact. And you know, the the, the example that I bring out uh, where this really starts is um, the former Canada Research Chair in Métis Identity at the Université Saint Boniface in Winnipeg, who is still there, is no longer a Canada Research Chair, um, but this is a Denis Gagnon, and so he's the one who starts publishing. Um, before 2010, 2006, 7, 8, 2009, these pieces where this narrative is repeated as a truth. No, no substantiation. There's no actual um, evidence. It's something that one must believe. And so I bring this up in the chapter that it's, it's a matter of faith. It's not a matter of, uh, of actual, uh, you know, one doesn't need to demonstrate it. It's not an, an, a, a matter of fact. It's a matter of faith. And then once Denis Gagnon starts writing this and getting this published in French, he becomes sort of uh, the expert, if you will, and um, people cite, cite his pieces as if there was actually an analysis done in them, but there is no analysis. Like I said, um, one can say whatever they want if, if they like, and, and that is certainly what happens in those early pieces. Um, and I'll just write it, I'll read a quotation here. 
um, from a, one of these early pieces, the earliest piece, in fact. And this is something I translated from French, just to give you a sense. Again, there's no, it's not backed up in any way, but uh, Métissage between European settlers and First Nation and Inuit women in the eastern part of the continent began in the 17th century, so the 1600s, and probably before then. Some of these mixed race individuals identified themselves as Métis and populate regions on the margins of the official state, Gaspésie, Abitibi, Saguenay, Labrador, Maritimes. Some assimilated into French or English Canadian society and others still among First Nations or Inuit. The development of the fur trade encouraged the migration of several individuals, some of whom were already Métis, to the Great Lakes and out west where they formed a distinct nation in what was then called Rupert's Land. So again, um, you know, this is an example of how Gagnon conflates different periods of time. Uh, you know, Europeans arrived in, in Labrador much later than the 17th century. He even suggests that this mixing could have happened before the 1600s. Again, no evidence of this. Um, and, and it's sort of just this conflation of time periods and events uh, that meet uh, in, in a way the desires that uh, Gagnon and others in this field have that um, the uh, people out east um, are the original Métis people and somehow uh, the Métis nation is stealing from them, um, which is very much a part of this literature. Uh, and so the second uh, theme, and I, I know that my time is limited here, so I'll do this one a little bit quicker, um, is uh, probably one that's predictable at this point, but um, I outline how um, the, the authors in this field, they really mobilize a Euro settler of nationalism um, that focuses on French and English when it comes to language and ethnicity. So uh, that's, I guess, a mild way of saying that it's a pretty old school French Canadian nationalism at play. Um, and I guess the, the most troubling aspect of that is how um, all of the all of these authors in this uh, subfield, if you will, Gagnon, like I mentioned, Etienne Rivard, Zorthe at the University of Saint Boniface, Sébastien Mallette, and a few others, but those three in particular focus on how the Métis are English speaking and therefore are oppressing French speaking people out east. So it becomes this story of English and French. There's no actual um, no actual consideration of the Métis being indigenous peoples. And the fact also that many Métis, in fact, I looked through the census records for this article, uh, for this chapter, and about 10,000 people who self-identify as Métis in the census out West speak an indigenous language. There's no consideration of that. This literature basically positions the Métis as somehow harming and acting in a colonial fashion towards French Canadians and Quebecois people who they um, sort of transform into, um, you know, indigenous peoples, as, uh, as I mentioned, Eastern Métis. So this self-indigenization -indig movement really depends on not only a changing of history, but then a, a, a consideration of contemporary um, political uh, questions that um, favors French Canadians and their claims, particularly as they pertain to French when it comes to Indigenous peoples. So we have this sort of perverse uh, situation where the Métis are rendered not really Indigenous because they speak English, but you have the, uh, the self-Indigenizers out East who are more authentically Indigenous because they speak French. Um, and of course, we know that French is in and of itself a colonial language. So I'm going to end there, and I'm more than happy to uh, take questions or comments later. Thank you very much, uh, Daryl. So last but not least is uh, uh, Dr. Brenda McDougall, uh, who is uh, the University Research Chair in Métis Family and Community Traditions at the University of Ottawa and director of uh, the Institute for Indigenous Research and Studies. She has been researching Métis community histories for many, many years and is the author of One of the Family Métis Culture in 19th Century Northwestern Saskatchewan and author of numerous, numerous articles, including Speak of Métis, Reading Family Life into Colonial Records. So please welcome uh, Dr. Brenda McDougall. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I say hello from the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I'd like Daryl and like Brenda, I'd like to thank the organizers of this particular event, but also that um, initial conference in Edmonton so many years ago now. It was uh, an exciting conference and often we don't think of conferences as being especially exciting, but this one was um, uh, an amazing mix of students and scholars and community people um, engaged in genuine conversation. And that was always, um, it's always super edifying to have that experience. So my particular title um, is How We Know Who We Are, Historical Literacy, Kinscapes and Defining a People. And I chose this title very deliberately because we often say we know who we are um, and we assume that everybody is speaking the same language or shares our values and our ideas about what that means to um, make such a statement. And I'm not always certain that we are always on the same page. And so I'm curious more about the how than, um, than the who in many respects. And I'm actually gonna read um, directly from some text because I uh, think that it might be the most uh, useful way of getting across my point. Um, and I want to, uh, before I start to read, say that the the pieces that I pulled to, to try and pull a lot of this together was to actually look at the genealogical connection between Louis Riel and Gabriel Dumont, um, two men who uh, you know, are enshrined in history for all eternity because of their role in Batash in 1885. And yet there's no historical evidence that they met prior to 1884 when Riel was brought back into um, what is now Saskatchewan uh, by Gabriel and a series of other men who went down to Montana to get him. So I'm just gonna start reading. Métis in Canada is now a proper noun, identifying an Indigenous nation with a history rooted in the contact experience of the fur trade that encouraged and fostered the emergence of a population of people, the offspring of fur traders and First Nations women, dedicated to its labour. More importantly, the society emerged in the late 18th and early 19th century in the western interior of Canada between Lake Superior and the Rocky Mountains and in the northwestern United States between Minnesota and Montana and carved out for itself a new and distinct cultural identity. And as fur companies driven by profit motive logic disinvested from them at various points in time and in different regions, this new people carved out an independent economy so that their families not only survived, but flourished. In turn, the society forged a political philosophy with attendant structures of governance rooted in their collective well-being and a sense of independence from other peoples. In short, by the early 19th century, this people, Métis, half-breed, Apitaukasan, developed a sense of loyalty to one another that superseded their loyalties to other. Within the context of this way of life, Métis fashioned a worldview emphasizing familial relationships as a system of reciprocal social obligations and material responsibilities. Métis society revolved around what historian Sami Lakamaki called kinscapes, relational constellations defining a cultural landscape that in turn permitted a people to maintain political and economic cohesiveness despite dispersed being dispersed across large geographical expanses. Historical Métis kinscapes were represented by a series of interfamilial communities connecting people who shared and acted upon mutually supported economic and political agendas, not just geographically, but also intergenerationally. Approaching these kinscapes is critical to developing historical literacy about who the Métis were and still are to persist in using the term Métis as an adjective equivalent to mixed in the context of this people reflects a stubborn refusal to fully accept how their culture evolved based on a coherent set of values not determined by lineage alone. But the power of genealogy to frame a Métis story runs deep in popular imagination. This sensibility about genealogy is integral to how Boyden, Joseph Boyden's story played out further rationalizing the manner in which Boyden personalized, uh, personified himself over the years 
he pointed to a sincere belief that his historical sources were either non-existent or unreliable. And this prevented him from being able to prove integral facts about his family's history. This belief also led to the following heartfelt assertion. My family's heritage is rooted in our stories. I've listened to them, both the European and the indigenous ones all my life. My mother's family history is certainly not laid out neatly in the official record or ancestry.ca either. This statement more than any other reflects another common discourse that the evidence required to definitively prove anyone's pers any one person's indigeneity is non-existent because of the ambiguous and elusive nature of historical records. Just as genealogies loom large in the popular imagination as the benchmark to prove Métisness, they are increasingly central to the historical studies of Métis families and communities within specific geographies. If the public spectacle of Boyden's unmasking shows us anything, it is that claiming indigeneity is one thing, but locating the evidence to support such a claim is quite another. And although many would have us believe that it is impossible, they are quite simply wrong. The aspirations of the contemporary Métis nation are tied closely to the social and material relations of the historic Métis kinscape. The Métis goal of self-governance managed by community values, goals, and aspirations did not die in 1885 with the defeat of Batoche, the execution of Riel, or the exile of Dumont. After 1885, Métis political organizations began reformulating. In 19, or sorry, in 1887, the the Union Nationale Métis Saint-Joseph de Manitoba was started in saint Vital, now a neighborhood in Winnipeg, by Joseph Riel and others. And about the same time, the people of St. Paul de Métis in Northern Alberta were organizing to protect their land rights. Both these organizations carried on the traditions of older Métis governance structures by defending Métis rights. Created by local communities, these types of political bodies were eventually found in communities across the prairies and by the 1930s and 40s had begun uniting to establish provincial bodies called societies that promoted socio-cultural activities, developed social service delivery programs and advocated for the protection of their rights within each province. The Métis Nation continues to exist not because of the genealogical lineages of individuals or even communities, but because of a collective people continuing to maintain their social and material connections to one another, politically and culturally. The ability of people to recognize one another cannot rest on lineage to long dead ancestors, but instead must be dependent on the lived relationships that continue to be forged between them. While historical literacy about who is Métis is required of non-Indigenous Canadians, it is also fundamental a fundamental teaching that Métis people themselves must become proficient in. Understanding how we know who we are is a critical responsibility of all Métis people. Only then can we safeguard against fraudulent or simply mistaken claims to our history and contemporary identity. This responsibility rests not with polit political representatives or with the state, but rather with the people themselves. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brenda. So Chris and I really hope that um, you will find the book intellectually engaging, uh, but also a good read. Um, and I, Chris, I was wondering if you wanted to say a few words before we turn to Nicole. Uh, no, no, I'm fine. I'm pretty happy with the way things are, are, uh, are going at the moment. So I'm happy just to, to pass it forward. Okay, so Nicole, um, I turn things to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the speakers. This has been so wonderful. Um, I'd like to invite everyone, um, all of the panelists to come and join me on screen if you'd like to. Um, and we'd be happy to open for some questions from the audience, um, if you can type them into the Q&A section, um, we would be happy to answer some questions. Um, and I will start with one. <laughs> um, Uh, I wanted to ask if you could speak a bit about um, about Harry Daniels and other Métis leaders and influences that led 
uh, to the court case. I don't know anyone anyone can answer. So there, I, I, I see Paul Chartrand is actually um, with us today and he was uh, integral to all of those conversations and would probably know far more than the rest of us. Uh, I, I, I wanna say that Harry Daniels, um, I only had an opportunity to meet him a few times. He was, um, he was interesting, he was dynamic, he was thoughtful and he, he had a clear sense of, of what his vision was and and his connection to all of those things as described by Brenda uh, herself. And so I think that we're honored to have, to be a part of a book that enshrines his name in such a, a profound and beautiful way. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add to that by saying that I, I uh, met uh, Harry several times, one of which was at a uh, a conference in uh, Winnipeg in 2001, in which he just showed up. I think uh, Paul Chartrand was presenting at the conference and he just showed up and uh, easily one of the most dynamic uh, people that I've ever met in my, my life. And he was just, he was funny and he was smart uh, and he had these really mature uh, political analyses uh, of, of things. And uh, uh, Paul teased him incessantly the whole time that he was there and he took it with kind of uh, equanimity and uh, just kind of a general uh, good good naturedness he was just a now yeah, he's just he's just a, a good solid dude and I'm not putting him on a pedestal I'm sure he had his foibles like like all of us but he was uh, uh, yeah it just it, it in some ways it changed my life as a Métis academic having met him and sort of seen some of the theories that we were talking about be put into practice and in fact being put into practice before uh, we had actually uh, we had actually learned about him. So yeah, he's a, he was a, I had a great interactions with him. Maybe we could uh, let Paul Chartrand talk if he if it's possible. I can do that if if Paul would like to talk. And she's with us. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, one second, Paul. On mute. Hello. I don't know if this is working. I can hear you. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm uh, puzzled by that technology. I uh, I couldn't get on and uh, I couldn't see anything at a black screen. And eventually some faces showed up. But it, it's the first time that I've participated in something like this. Apparently it's called a webinar. I, I've had many meetings on Zoom and Teams and other things. But this is a new experience for me. So uh, I didn't really know what was going on. and. Uh, uh, my hearing is very bad, and uh, I couldn't really hear what that uh, young lady Nicole was saying. And, and but I gathered that uh, someone was uh, someone was speaking about Harry or something. So I thought, uh, uh, you know, if, if that's what you were asking about, to say something about Harry, well, I say, well, yes, I could say something uh, very briefly about Harry. It's, uh, time's almost up. So he was like a brother to me, you know, one of my closest friends in, in my life. And, uh, you know, so obviously I could talk for a long time about, about it, but I won't. I'll just mention uh, that uh, I uh, worked with Harry and with uh, Professor Dale Gibson. Uh, at actually in a building in uh, central Edmonton on the original pleadings in the uh, Daniels case. But as you would know, uh, that's at the time that Harry was a president of CAP. And then you would know that after that other people took over. So I haven't had any uh, association with the uh, conduct of the litigation subsequent to that. But anyway, the, uh, Harry was a great guy. As I've pointed out uh, in a couple of places, uh, uh, we, we owe to uh, Harry and uh, Louis Riel, the, uh, the mention of the Métis people in the Constitution of Canada. And uh, I remember well that occasion in Edmonton and uh, I tell people, uh, someday I'll tell you the kind of uh, wine that we enjoyed after we'd done some very hard work for a couple of days. So. I want to end by congratulating all the speakers today. I thought it was an excellent uh, presentation by everyone. The book sounds fantastic. And I'm doubly happy because having heard all those excellent summaries now, I might 
save myself the $75 or whatever the book costs. But again, my congratulations to all of you. Very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. We do have a couple of questions. Um, I will start. Um, we have a question from Michelle Porter, who asks, for students and emerging Métis scholars today, what are some of the areas of research that will support or give back to the Métis nation today? When you say emerging, do you mean newly Métis or do you mean junior scholars? <laughs> ah. Junior scholars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, from from I'll, I'll kind of take a stab at this. From my perspective, it's it's less important what things in particular we study, uh, and more important that we think about kind of who we're working in relationship with when we do the work that we we do. Because you know, very often for those who work uh, in community and with community, you start off thinking your the project is going to be about one thing. It turns out to be uh, often about something else entirely and the reasons why you're basically being allowed into community is not the same reasons necessarily that you think uh, your project is valuable or important so it's that kind of engagement and um and relations that becomes an important element we're metis are a, a many splendor jewel and we could sit here for the next you know uh, next couple of hours talking about all the different things that we could do uh, research about but it's the it's for me it's the especially as i as i, I get uh, get older uh, it's more about the engagement than it is the actual specific um, topics that you that you uh, do research on or with. Thank you, Chris. Um, I also I see that we are at the end of our time, and I know if anyone has to has to run, that's okay. But if we if we have time for a couple more questions, there are some more. So if we're feeling to a couple more, okay. <laughs> So there's one here from Bridget Larocque, who asks, or she says, thank you for this timely book by such great minds. I'm wondering if your research and legal analysis has been unruly challenged by the Eastern Métis in quotations. And Daryl, how are the Inuit Métis? Have you had any conversation have had any conversations with you? Sorry, I, I thought the legal analysis question was for someone else. Um, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, I, I, there are definitely challenges to my to my analysis, but if you mean um, like the Daniels decisions is not, it doesn't really, uh, is not used by these organizations out East. Um, they claim that it, confirms their their sort of claims to being quote unquote Métis or being indigenous. That's not what the decision actually does. Um, but when they go to court, they, they use a, a series of other arguments that are assessed by the Pauli criteria. So that's like a different type of, of claim that they're making. Um, uh, let's see. And and as for the last part, yeah, uh, it was, it's like I said, and this is Gagnon sort of quotation that sort of brings Labrador in and Inuit people into the definition of uh, these people out East. Um, uh, I'm not really sure what to say. I've been contacted by all people, all indigenous peoples in Labrador to work for them in the past year. And that's something I can't do just because there are conflicting views of the different types of claims that organizations are making. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on in Labrador, um, but I'm, I'm not at liberty of talking about it. Thank you, Daryl. Oh, let me just turn off my email. Um, we have a question from Jesse Thistle, um, which says, how do we as young Métis scholars coming back to our identities stop these newly minted race shifters from using our family names and twisting it to fit their histories? They've learned to use the language of kinship. Some names that come to mind are Montour or Arcand that I've seen 
these Eastern mixed bloods use. Um, well, you know, it's it's like the word Métis itself. I think, Jesse, the word has evolved and the word is different and the surnames evolved and the surnames are different. Um, you know, there's there's an equal number of people with, well, maybe not quite equal, but there's a significant number of people also with Scottish surnames that doesn't make them Scottish. Um, we're not misplaced French Canadians and we're not misplaced Scots and we're not misplaced anybody's. Um, and part of, part of the problem of these, uh, you know, th there are people that are sort of genuinely confused and are looking for some sort of belonging. And then there are other people that are a little bit more um, calculating as, as Daryl describes, but part of it is recognizing um, that what we're talking about is completely different. And we are not part of something else. We are we are completely different, right? So, people who are who who want to claim matiness are often um, framing it as a well, I'm part First Nations, I'm part something else, as opposed to recognizing that we're a hundred percent something different. And and it's it's just continuing continuing to come back to those things. I've also heard that you know Dumont's in Quebec must be Métis because Gabriel Dumont was Métis. Well, that's nonsense, right? Like these are nonsensical, non-starter conversations. And 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 there comes a point where you just have to tell people that they're being silly. Uh, I, I write about specifically how how these claims work about like the family names that Brenda just brought up in chapter three of my book because um, yeah. For a variety of reasons, things that I was studying for my book. And um, I think Brenda mentioned this as well earlier, uh, just that part of the response is, I think, also the knowing of these histories. Um, because the more you know about these histories, I think it, it also becomes easier to articulate if you feel you need to, which I don't think Métis people should feel they need to. But if you're in a context where that's useful, then I think it could be useful to, you know, to know those histories and about those families, where they lived, who they were in relationships with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there was another part to that question I wanted to bring up, but, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna say, <laughs> sorry. Thank you for that. We have another question from Justin Weeb, who says, um, it's been five years since the Daniels decision. Can you speak a bit more to the ramifications of Daniels on the actual Métis Nation and our collective rights, i.e. what has progressed, regressed, what is different or not, what opportunities are available now that weren't pre-Daniels, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I don't think it's... The, the impact of court cases like this and, and all court cases like this are, are um, they're not linear and they're not necessarily that easy to, to untangle. And of course, very often with things like this, you can only untangle them um, retrospectively. And I'm not sure that five years is enough time on its own. The one thing I will say is that, uh, is that uh, um, Métis organizations have used this as one tool among uh, several uh, to build uh, the kinds of um, nation-based relationships that have been built uh, with the, the federal government and in some cases with the provincial governments. But you know, another another way that we see the the Daniels decision uh, popping up is sometimes um, students talking about making claims to being Métis on campus are uh, glomming on to uh, kind of decontextualized chunks of the of the uh, court decision um, as well. So yeah, it's uh, it's um, it, it's a it, it, it is definitely a rabbit hole, and it's and it takes a lot of kind of uh, dedicated work, which as having been an administrator for the last five years, I haven't done. Uh, but it would it would well be worth uh, chasing down all these different uh, social arenas to see kind of how it's refracted and manifest itself manifested itself into those arenas. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, Jesse Thistle says, thank you, I will read chapter three. And we have another question from 
Adam Kowal, who asks, as a follow-up to Professor Thistle's question, would one of the panelists or attendees be able to point to a resource that would be useful in delineating these lines for those with newly discovered Métis heritage in a way that is both clarifying and welcoming? I have in mind students entering into professional academics. No. No, no, I'm not being sarcastic about that. There's no, there's no easy way into this. There's no, there's no way into this that doesn't require you to sit with a certain level of discomfort. Um, if people have particular uh, points of heritage that they're claiming, then it's up to you to do the work to kind of reconnect. Uh, uh, I, I think a lot of uh, Brenda McDougall's article, uh, the ethno history article, where she talks about the distinction, I'm gonna be using the third person or second person, Brenda, as though you're not here. Uh, the distinction between a uh, genealogy uh, which is basically, you know, a form of mathematics, uh, which uh, which Daryl has talked about in, in great length in his book, and kinship in terms of ongoing relationships. If you're making genealogical claims to being Métis, okay, but you should also be thinking in terms of kinship. If you want to think of a, a clear book that kind of delineates from, from way back when, it's uh, the book that Paul Chartrand uh, edited, Who Are Canada's Aboriginal Peoples? And then there are various books that have come out since then, but Paul kind of really set out those those different pathways for for thinking about this, but there's there's no easy way into into doing this. And another book that I think does a good job of laying out the logics, even though it's an American context, is uh, Dr. Jill Dofler's book "Those Who Belong." A uh, similar job does an excellent job in terms of talking about the difference between rights and thinking about kind of obligations, relations, and and responsibilities. So that becomes a, it's being willing to sit with that discomfort and kind of uh, connect your way in. Uh, rather than just assuming that there's something that can that can be read and possessed and kind of a way a way we go. Uh, sorry to the questioner, not that that's what you were suggesting, but just saying that this is all this is all this is all kind of a source of of discomfort. Yeah, and I I'm just going to follow up a little bit on Chris. I think you know we we want the easy answer to be um, to be available to us. We go to university to to maybe learn more and those things are possible, but it's also that that hard work of working with community people um, and and listening to what people have to say. And, you know, the the work that people did in the 30s and 40s and 60s and 70s are all critical points of realizing what it was people were working for. And if we ignore all of that work and think that it's just all the same thing, then we're, we're missing the messaging that, that they've laid for us, that people like Harry Daniels and Paul Chartrand and Maria Campbell um, laid out for us. And we have to track that work down and we have to pay attention to what it is that they were saying then so that we can hear what they're trying to tell us now. Thank you so much, Brenda and Chris. Um, I see Daryl has also put a link in our chat to um, those who belong, the book on our website. Um, we have a question from Dennis Michelson, who asks um, for any thoughts or discussion in the book on the possibility that the relative organizational success of the MN has attracted some non-status First Nations people to adopt that identity, whereas if CAP had achieved the same level of recognition, um, then perhaps they would have found home there. So the the issue the issue of Métis non-status status these are all categories of the state, and uh, you know on the one hand we have we those are what those are the tools we have to work with, um, but non-status. Uh, First Nations people are, are our relatives. Um, and they did a lot of the hard work of the early political or organizing. You know, the famous five of Alberta, um, several of them are First Nations men without status. So, you know, we can't leave those relatives behind. And these are not hard and fast categories. These are categories based on our families. Creeness matters more than, than status. Um, 
you know, when I, when I used to be in Northern Saskatchewan with some of the communities and you would ask them who they were, they would tell you in Cree that they were Nehiao. It didn't mean that they weren't Métis, they were speaking of the language that they spoke, right? And so that was their place. And then they would say, but we're not treaty. So now they're telling me that they're not status Indians, right? So these things are layered and they're complex and the way that people interact around them are shaped by the social and material relations in which they're living. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that Daniel's decision or the Daniel's case came forward with Métis and non-status people, that's important. Those were important signifiers at the era in which these indigenous people were completely disenfranchised from all state uh, action. Um, I don't know if that helps at all or if that just muddies the waters a little bit more, but you know, we're, we're not disavowing our relationships to people when we talk about being Métis. We have to embrace all of those things and we have to be attendant to understanding what they mean. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, I think that might be all of our questions. Um, so I'm wondering if the panelists have any final comments or would like to add anything before we head out? Well, simply to, to thank everybody for, for coming to, to this launch. And uh, we do hope that uh, people are going to find the book uh, interesting and, uh, and that hopefully it will open the door for more uh, analysis around the Daniels decision. As Chris said, it takes uh, time to, to get a sense of what, you know, the impact of a specific uh, Supreme Court decision. So, so in that sense, I mean, I, well, we hope that there's going to be other books also published uh, that continue in, in, in that trade. So, so thank you all for, for being here and thank you uh, very much uh, to Daryl and the two Brendas uh, for uh, coming uh, today and spending time with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you, Nicole, for, for everything you've done around this, uh, this launch. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, University of Manitoba Press. Keep up the good work. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, son. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone, as well, for coming. And remember, you can buy the book on our website with our 30% off code, which is Daniels30. So get your copy. <laughs> Bye.